Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Wound Care Today Facebook Live. Uh, before we start, just a massive thank you to you all for joining us. Um, the weather's been rubbish, um, Omicron's in our world, and we're well aware how busy you guys are. So just a massive thank you from me and the team for joining tonight's event, um, which is called Maintaining Skin Integrity from Prevention to Complex Skin Disorders. And our two amazing speakers tonight are Jackie Dark and Jackie Fletcher. Good evening, both. Good evening. Good. Um, before we start, just a quick one. Um, a huge congratulations on behalf of me and my team, Jackie Fletcher, who's just been awarded by Princess Anne and OBE for services to wound care. Well done, Jackie, and I hope you are as proud as you should be. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, it was a fabulous day, and I am incredibly proud to be representing our specialty. Good. You've been a legend ever since I started in this world in '96. I know how much you've given of yourself to our community. So just a huge congratulations. So thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, both Jackies are doing tonight's event from home. So if we have any technology problems, please bear with us and we'll get them sorted as soon as possible. Um, the event will be available on Facebook Live forever. We're also gonna put it up on our Wound Care Today website where you can download the slides. The link for your certificate of attendance will be made available towards the end of tonight's event, and that will count towards your revalidation portfolio. Um, as both our speakers will agree, the more involved, the more engaged you are, the better it is for the event. So please um, go on the comment bar, ask questions, and we'll endeavour to answer as many of them as possible towards the end of tonight's event. Um, before we start, just a massive thank you to our partners tonight, who are Smith & Nephew. Um, they have been healing wounds in the UK for over 150 years. Guys, you're the heart of our community. Um, your ongoing commitment to both patients and healthcare professionals is awesome. Thank you for your support of independent education um, from me and the team. Um, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, who is Jackie Fletcher OBE. Over to you, Jackie. Thanks, Ed, and thank you to Smith & Nephew for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, my session today is going to be talking about maintaining skin integrity, moving us from prevention through to complex skin disorders. I'm not going to pick up the complex skin disorders. I'm going to pass over to Jackie to do that. So the purpose of my session is talking about the focusing on the promotion of healthy, intact skin. And the key to that, I suppose, is about prevention. So what we're hoping to achieve is prevention of all those wounds that you see on a regular basis. So whether that's pressure ulcers, moisture-associated skin damage, medical adhesive-related skin injuries, skin tears, leg ulcers, or diabetic foot ulcers, we need to think about what it is to do to prevent them happening. And I think one of the challenges we have in clinical practice is that we tend to silo those particular wounds and we think about prevention in relation to pressure ulcers, prevention in relation to diabetic foot ulcers. But actually what we're talking about is maintaining healthy skin. And the principles of maintaining good skin integrity are all the same across all wound etiologies. And they're really quite simple. What we're looking at is keeping the skin clean, keeping it dry, keeping it well hydrated, and protecting it from the relevant external forces, whether that's pressure, shear and friction, whether it's moisture or whether it's trauma. So skin assessment is perhaps one of the underpinning elements of care when we're thinking about maintaining skin integrity. We need to have a baseline to know what we're talking about and where we need to be going. And too often we focus on skin assessment being a visual activity. So it's about looking at the skin and that might involve getting torches or getting the difficult, difficult areas. But we need to remember that it isn't always about skin uh, visual assessment. It's about other things. And the other thing to say is, particularly at the minute, visual skin assessment can be tricky because you might not actually be with the patient. So you might be on the telephone and asking them to describe the skin, or you might be doing a video and the patient may be trying to show you their skin. And if that's on, on a leg, that might be reasonably easy, but if it's their bottom, less so. So we're going to think about skin inspection, including uh, other than visible skin changes, sensation and odour. And I just want to put kind of a plea in about touch because 
touch is a very personal thing. And I guess a lot of you have missed that over the last 18 months because it's very much about a two way communication. It, it can sometimes convey significantly more than words. You will have been in situations where a patient's in a very difficult situation and you don't need to say anything. What you need to do is put your hand on their arm or just touch them. And that shows them that you're there with them. It also can help with patients who feel that they're unclean. You know, some patients, particularly with things like uh, psoriasis or eczema and their skin flakes off, don't always feel clean. And the fact that you're prepared to touch them says a lot. So it shows them that they're cared for. But it also allows us to pick up a significant amount of information. Uh, so if you are touching a patient's skin, you can be feeling the temperature, you can be feeling the texture. But very importantly, it helps to build trust. One of the ways communicate with patients is through touch and building their trust is really important but obviously ensure that the patient is happy with that level of trust and touch and some people don't like to be touched at all and I think we as clinicians seem to think we have permission to do that it becomes very kind of bland to us to touch somebody even in quite personal areas and it's not always the case for the patient. So as I said I wanted to start off with mentioning visuals but remembering they might not be enough so I'm hoping many of you will now be familiar with this best practice statement that reminds us uh, about assessing skin of different skin tones is not always easy. And that there's a very strong message that skin tone isn't just about pressure ulcers. And I know some of this around dark skin came about as a response to react to red because we were looking for redness as a sign of uh, hyperemia or erythema. But we use redness incorrectly often in lots of other skin conditions. So we should be talking about colour change and comparing like with like. And colour isn't just about what's happening in the surrounding skin. It can be leading us to suspect things within the wound. So if you've seen, as in this picture on the right, that lovely purple, what's described as a violaceous margin of a wound, that might lead you to suspect something like pyoderma gangrenosum. The picture next to that, that lovely foot, that heel with that white cobblestone should be telling you that that white edge around the wound is about overhydration. This is very macerated and I would suspect as well as the bit around the heel, that bit actually around the wound, that tissue is actually so overhydrated, it's probably now uh, non-viable. I don't think I need to tell any of you what that lovely blue green colour of that visual tells you there. What you're looking here at here is pseudomonas, both in the wound and on the dressing. So visuals do tell us some things, but they're not all of the picture because colour can be misleading. And you can see in these three images here. So on the top left, hopefully you can very clearly see that that striated creamy yellow bit in the wound is tendon. Very obvious, very easy to see. However, if you look at the picture on the top right, which is also a leg, if you look through the middle of that wound, hopefully you can see running from about 11 o'clock on a clock down to five o'clock, there is also tendon underneath that slough. And we need to be really careful that the, that the slough and the tendon that are the same colour don't distract us. If you're ever unsure about the presence of tendon, if that's what you can see, then the easy thing to do is ask the patient to move their foot up and down and you'll see that tendon moving. And I'm hoping all of you will also realise that, that picture at the bottom, which is a bottom, which has across the middle of it, so moving from right to left, what looks like a creamy white striated mark which could easily be slough if I'd zoomed it out, could easily be tendon, and um, is clearly not, it's slough, because you don't have a large tendon running down the back of your bottom. So moving away from the visuals and onto touch, what can the texture indicate? Well, if the tissues are hard, the most obvious reason is often edema, uh, and that can be related to the buildup of fluid, or it can be inflammation, and that can be an inflammatory disease or process, or it can be infection. Hard skin can also indicate the presence of callus, which in itself is a protective mechanism uh, and builds up as a response to pressure. If the tissue is soft or the thing we describe as boggy, if you don't know what bogginess is, if you've ever gone to your fridge, reached in the back and found a, a cucumber that you'd forgotten about, you know, when you pick it up and it all squelches, that's what we mean by bogginess. That usually describes tissue death, tissue shouldn't feel like that, or that something has become detached from the underlying structures. 
thinking about other kind of textures, if the, the texture of the skin is very rough, does that indicate dehydration? Is it a matter of good hygiene? So again, I'm sure many of you have seen patients with lower limb ulceration with lots of that dehydrated scab type skin. And I think as clinicians, we all quite like to pick that off, but we need to be really careful that we don't cause further skin damage. But what we often find underneath there is healthy skin. Smooth skin, we would say, well, maybe all is well. You know, if you've got a well hydrated, nice plump skin, then that feels good. But also, is it smooth? Is it tight and shiny because of edema or an indication of infection? Or does it tell you about underlying disease processes? Temperature change tells us a little bit about what might be happening as well. So again, if you're going to feel, we often use the back of our hand to feel the area and compare that to an area a little bit distance. You might be looking at signs of infection. So in the picture on the left and the picture at the bottom, you can see there that that's a very clear infection. Uh, the one on the bottom right is a friend of a friend who decided to balance out a piece of on their leg whilst they drilled it and you can see they've drilled straight into their own leg and obviously bits of wood and other debris have gone into that wound and the wounds become infected. The picture at the top you can see uh, is a, a lady who was on antibiotics and this is pure inflammation, this is a reaction to the medication she was taking. But you can also get this kind of hot uh, area with dermatitis or contact dermatitis, can be environmental, and it can be about the patient wearing too many clothes in a particular area of the body. Something that we underestimate or underdescribe, I think, in wound assessment is sensation change. So we'll all be very familiar with loss or sometimes change or increase in sensation in patients with diabetes. We know that patients with severe neuropathy can have total absence of sensation. They can walk on drawing pins, they can have nails through their feet and not know about that. Pain is a good indicator. Often in patients with chronic wounds, the patient will tell you I have pain all the time, but actually my pain today is different. And that may indicate uh, the onset of a, an infection. But we forget about things like itch. Lots of patients with chronic wounds or with inflammation talk about itch and it's very, very underestimated. We rarely see it in our wound assessment tools. But as you can see from this patient here, this is a patient who has had peripheral arterial disease uh, and because of that has got lots of nerve damage, poor blood supply. And you can see they have scratched their leg until it bleeds. And we see this sometimes under things like bandages or under a plaster of Paris. And we used to call this knitting needle syndrome where patients were seeking attention. But actually the heat, the inflammation, the dryness causes severe itch. We can also see tingling, which may uh, talk about there being a, a fungal or a viral presence, or it can be indicative of the need to scratch. Something else that we use in our assessment is odour, and I've shown you these slides before as pseudomonas. There are some odours that are very indicative of certain things. So uh, I'm guessing most of you would recognise this in the same way that we recognise uh, things like clostridium or other kinds of diarrhoea. A lot of odours patients feel are more noticeable than we might feel them. So to me, most chronic wounds have a very distinct smell. And I used to always joke with my colleague that you could put me blindfold in a room and I could tell you if the patient had a pressure ulcer or a leg ulcer because of the very particular smell that they have for those. Because that's quite normal to us doesn't mean that it's normal to the patient. And it can be a reason why the patient isolates or becomes very anxious and they perceive that to be quite pungent. Then there are other kind of skin manifestations that we're assessing for that tell us about underlying disease. So we are quite used to looking for things like the purple edge in, in pyoderma. And more recently, we've started to see the indications of COVID presenting a skin manifestation. And if for some patients, particularly during wave one, uh, where we were seeing patients who were coming to uh, ED departments quite unwell, really the main symptom they had were these unusual skin presentations. And you can see they've been grouped here in different ways. But one of the most common things we saw was this chilblain-like acral pattern. Acral just means distal. Um, and for no apparent reason, these patients were presenting with kind of chilblains on their toes or their fingers. And really that was the only thing they had. 
that indicated they had COVID until we did the blood test on them. So skin assessment is really a fundamental aspect of care. And, and I want to emphasize how important skin is to individuals because we've all got skin. We all know how important skin to skin contact is. And it, it, it does worry me how much I see people wearing gloves for things that don't need gloves. If you're doing somebody's pulse, actually, as long as you wash your hands afterwards, why would you need to be wearing gloves? Follow the right infection prevention procedures but there is nothing wrong with skin to skin contact. And that helps communicate much more. You feel the patient's uh, rate and rhythm of their pulse better. You feel the temperature and the texture of their skin whilst you're doing that. But as, as I said previously, the skin communicates with us, but also for us. Uh, and this lady that you can see here happens to be my big sister uh, and she will not go swimming. She hates going to buy new shoes because she does not like showing her legs in public because she thinks people think she's unclean. Uh, she once heard somebody talking about her scabby legs uh, and that is obviously very distressing. So we need to think about how we react to people's skin People think we will react to their skin, which may not be how we will react. But we need to treat skin well and see it as having healthy skin as a really fundamental aspect of all care. It's not just about wounds, it's about maintaining patients' health and well-being. So if we're looking at good skin care, we need to establish a baseline. So going back to those principles I mentioned earlier, determine what the problem is. Is the skin too dry? Is it too wet? What's the cause of that? So is that about the patient being incontinent? Is it because they have had a stroke and they're dribbling? And um, what else might it be? Quite often patients are very dehydrated. You know, we've got lots of elderly patients who don't drink because they take diuretics and it makes them need to wee. So think about systemic as well as topical approaches. So is it about hydrating the skin or is it about hydrating the patient? Remember to think about the psychological as well as physical care and try and standardize the approach. We don't need to be doing really complex regimens of skincare. Really, for most instances, we can follow a very simple pathway and think about having step up and step down options. So you can think, see here an example of a skincare pathway. So this one's looking at moisture associated skin damage. And any pathway has some key elements. It should be easy to follow, give clear guidance. Pictures are always good. But it should include things like when you start, how you use the products and how often, when to step up and when to step down, and when to refer on. And you can see here in this skin care pathway uh, around MASD, not only does it have those really crucial elements, it also helps to give a differential diagnosis. It kind of points you to, is this IAD? Is this uh, intertrigo? Is it peri-wound moisture damage or peristomal damage. And that's really important because getting the diagnosis right, even if it's moisture associated, might influence what you can and can't do or what you might want to get the patient to do to be involved in that. So hopefully what I've done is give you uh, an overview of what to do with the kind of basic things when you're doing a good assessment and you have a plan for maintaining good in in skin integrity. But sometimes the overall picture doesn't quite add up and some of the things are out of the ordinary. And so I'm going to hand over to Jackie now, who's going to tell you about some slightly difficult things and some slightly less common things. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jackie. Um, as Jackie said, I'm going to be talking about ageing and complex skin conditions because that's a large cohort of the patients that we see. And you may be looking at some of the conditions that we talk about in this session and think that they're not particularly complex, but actually the fact that they are recurrent sometimes makes them a little bit more complex in nature. So let's think about aging skin to start with. We know that skin changes due to biological aging, and that can be further impacted by environmental issues, lifestyle choices and disease. But it's really important that we understand these changes so that we can be alert to the risks, identify them and intervene early to improve skin health. These anatomical diagrams show the structural changes associated with biological aging. You can see the image on the right, and um, there's a lot of reduced thickness in particularly the epidermis and the dermis. And we know that that reduces by at least a, a fifth. We know that the basement membrane between both the, the dermis and the epidermis 
becomes a lot more fragile and there's less contact between the two. And that's going to be really important later when we look at one of the complex skin conditions that we, we have to manage. We know that the skin strength and elasticity reduces and protection from UV exposure is also reduced. So when there's a break in skin integrity, particularly um, when we're older, then that repair and regeneration is delayed. Aging skin offers much less protection against pressure, infection and environmental pollutants. And that's generally due to less fat cells, reduction in elastic fibres and also a reduced immune response. And in addition to this, there's this reduced ability to maintain skin hydration and temperature. So just as Jackie was saying, it's really important that nutrition and hydration are an important aspect of management for our patients. So these are just some of the impacts of skin changes and disease that we commonly see in our aging population. You can see the images to the right um, show skin changes to some exposed sites. So you can see the actinic, actinic or solar keratosis. And then the image at the bottom is bruising due to systemic steroids. So the three um, listed at the bottom here, cellulitis, bullous pemphigoid and skin tears, those are the three that we're going to be exploring this evening in a bit more detail. So firstly, let's look at cellulitis. So what is it? I'm sure you're all familiar with cellulitis. It's a common bacterial skin infection. We know it affects the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Generally, in the elderly, it's predominantly the lower limbs. About 80 to 90% of it will be impacted by the lower limbs. You can see complications include a number of things, but in particular sepsis. One of the things to consider is that the, the limbs are suited at the most common site in the elderly, but um, within the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, developed by NHS England and NHS Improvement, they've got three work streams, and all of them are designed to reduce unwarranted variation in wound care. One of them is a lower limb pathway, and they've published recommendations for the lower limb, and they include a simple pathway highlighting some of the red flag symptoms that require immediate attention. And within that list of red flag symptoms, cellulitis is one of them. So what are the risks for cellulitis? So previous episodes of cellulitis, so if you've had it once before, your chances of getting it again are increased. Immune suppression, disease and medication, and certainly lymphedema and chronic edema. Skin integrity changes increase your risk. So you can see on the right a number of images demonstrating um, fungal infection, demonstrating eczema, and just fissuring of the heels. And all of these expose the patient to much more risk of, of cellulitis. So ensuring that the skin remains in good health is vital for reducing um, complications. So I'm sure you're all familiar with how cellulitis presents, but it's worth remembering that it's a really acute onset and those clinical signs and symptoms generally increase over a relatively short time period. It's worth highlighting that erythema that we used to, to describe sort of the redness and the inflammatory response in the skin we know actually presents very differently in people with darker skin tones. So again just demonstrating that changes in pigmentation in the skin, and that generally presents as a hyperpigmentation or purple hues, is likely to indicate that there's an inflammatory response going on. Obviously, that does increase the risk of this patient cohort because it's not so obvious. So our skin assessment and observation skills are even more important. Necrosis of the tissue may be present, and in some instances, blisters may form. Pain may not be an indicator for those patients with neuropathy, as Jackie explained earlier, um, particularly with diabetes. So it's worth bearing that in mind if we're using that as an indicator. If we're thinking about trying to determine what the causative organism is, then sometimes we could uh, take a, um, a swab for microscopy, which is only really going to offer some, um, some guidance if there is an open wound. So taking a skin swab is unlikely to, to actually offer the impending organism. Raised blood markers may support your clinical findings, but this needs to be actioned really quickly in order to manage the patient ideally within their own care setting and also reduce the risk of sepsis. So how do we manage cellulitis? So in the short term, the recommendations from most documents, including NICE and the British Lymphology Guidelines, are elevation of the affected part, if that's possible. And oral antibiotics are first-line choice. 
If we do need to um, implement IV antibiotics, then they need to be reviewed within a 48 hour period. And again, as much as we can, we need to be keeping those patients in their own care setting. When we're thinking about antibiotic management, it's important to follow your local guidance within your organisation regarding antibiotics of choice. And as per the National Wound Care Strategy Red Flag Guidance within the lower limb recommendations, patients with a diabetic foot wound should be referred immediately to a multidisciplinary team. And patients with a true diagnosis of cellulitis should not be managed in compression, particularly in the acute phase. We do know that cellulitis is often misdiagnosed, so it's vital that we, we get it right. One of the, the images you can see here on the left are of cellulitis, and the image on the right is of lipidermatosclerosis, which is an inflammatory condition associated with chronic edema. This condition is usually bilateral, which is unlike cellulitis, and the surrounding heat is much less than cellulitis on none at all, and patients are generally well unlike um, cellulitis, where there's generally a malaise or a fever present. Um, another condition here is bullous pemphigoid. So these images in isolation look very similar. You can see that there's blistering on a bed of erythema. Um, so the clinical picture looks the same. However, with all the um, underlying history that you're going to gain from your patient, it would be very clear that actually this isn't cellulitis. So you can see the image on the right is, is indicative of bullous pemphigoid. And that's gonna be the next subject that we're going to focus on this evening. So bullous pemphigoid, when we talk about bullous, we mean blisters. And in general, we know that blisters occur for a variety of reasons. Some acute, some rare, and some are related to common local infections, such as cellulitis, as we've talked about already. But they may include things like impetigo and herpes simplex. The bullous pemphigoid belongs to a group of chronic blistering disorders and is known to be the most common Western autoimmune blistering disease. But well, when we describe autoimmune conditions, we're referring to the immune system producing antibodies against naturally occurring substances in the body. So in this instance, we're talking about the basement membrane of the epidermis, which you if you remember an aging skin is already compromised. So this contact between the epidermis and the dermal layer um, actually is, is reduced significantly. This then causes the epidermal blister formation um, between those two layers. What causes bullous pemphigoid? There's no real define, defining causal agents. However, it's suggested that skin injury, for example, um, sunburn and trauma may trigger some periods of pemphigoid and several drugs have been implicated. These, can, these include frismide, spironolactone and penicillamine. Some of the authors will describe male and females being equally affected. However, some will suggest that there is an increase in the female population. It's often described as either generalized, so affecting at least 50% of the trunk and the limbs, or it can be more localized. It may be just uh, lo located purely in the lower limbs or even in the feet. What is a, um, a common clinical picture though is, is an itch that's often described and pre, uh, precedes the rush by several months. So patients will describe a generalized itchy or a pruritus um, several months before the blisters uh, appear. And that's an important aspect when we're trying to obtain patient history and also trying to determine the diagnosis of what, what might be presenting clinically. Interestingly, once the blisters appear, the patients themselves are generally well. Um, we know that patient, about a quarter of our patients will experience mucosal blisters and they're predominantly found in the mouth. The blisters themselves, as we said, are, are subepidermal. They may contain clear or bloodstained fluid and that can be quite um, concerning for patients when they see that those bloodstained blisters occur. If they rupture, a crust is often formed and the blisters will heal without scarring because they sit within that epidermis and dermal layer. However, they will leave some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and that may take a few months to resolve. In terms of diagnosis, how do we diagnose bullous pemphigoid? So you may need to refer to the GP and or dermatology for diagnosis, management or advice, depending upon how, um, how extensive the bullous disorder is and whether you're trying to keep your patient in their own home. Ensure that you have the full clinical picture and your history. It may be that um, skin biopsy is required and that will incur a skin biopsy taken adjacent to the blister 
Um, they do direct immunofluorescent staining, and then that highlights antibodies along the basement membrane that lies between obviously the epidermis and the dermis that we've mentioned already. We can take blood tests, they include an, an indirect immunofluorescence test, and that tries to look for circulating pemphigoid antibodies. The management though can take over several years. Um, generally, it usually commences with the course of systemic steroids, while screening will take place for longer term immunosuppressive agents. The steroids are increased until there's no further blistering, and then gradually that, that dose is decreased adjusting if new blisters are up. So you may stay on the or you may increase if new blisters are occurring. And then you literally stop and continue that, that regime until there's no more blister formation. Emollients can be used and they can be helpful, particularly antimicrobial emollients as well, or emollients with antipyritic agents. And actually, if, um, if the area that's affected is less than 10%, then potent topical steroids can be used on the, at the blister site to try and reduce, um, try and reduce further blister formation. So systemic treatments, as you can see there, will be steroids and sometimes tetracycline antibiotics, either in isolation or jointly with steroids, um, particularly those that are steroid sparing. Over the longer term, then we would implement immunosuppressive agents. However, these require regular monitoring because there's a number of side effects with them. And including that, one of the side effects is cutaneous malignancy. So just be aware when you're looking at other skin issues that are occurring with that patient, that that may not be one of them. So moving on from bullous pemphigoid, I just really wanted to focus a little bit on skin tears. And um, interestingly, one of the reasons for skin tears, and I'm calling that more complex, is that they tend to occur repeatedly across our patient cohort and repeatedly within the same patients. So these images demonstrate this as they all occurred in a repeat offender. And I feel okay to call that the patient a repeat offender in this instance, as it's my mum, June, um, and she's given me consent to share her images and story with her, or with you, sorry. So what are skin tears? So back in 2018, the International Skin Tear Advisory Panel, ISTAP, defined them as a traumatic wound caused by mechanical forces, which also includes removal of adhesives. They don't, however, extend through the subcutaneous layer. They've also developed best practice recommendations as skin tears are often mismanaged and this is free to download. So it's really about, again, trying to improve the management and unwarranted variation. So the ISTAP guidance allows us to determine our management based on skin tear type, divided into three simple skin types, type one, type two, and type three. And you can see the different descriptors above the, the relevant images. So in our organization, we've just launched a skin tear pathway within the community element of the organization. And that was predominantly prompted by the number of calls that community nursing were receiving from carers, um, calls out, um, significantly really for a lot of them just for managing type 1 skin tears. So the aim of the pathway is that carers can manage type 1 and they would refer types 2 and 3 on to other clinicians such as community nursing. However, they've got some guidance about how to immediately manage the skin tear whilst waiting for the clinician to come and assess. So recommendations from the consensus document offer advice regarding strategies that are recommended and those to be avoided. So these are the ones that, or some of them that are, are recommended within the document. They discuss a number of first aid management um, situations, and then also discuss advice for wound management. Particularly, they talk about the use of adhesive dressings. So if they are to be used, and we see them often used on upper limbs or for patients with cognitive disorders, they need to be gentle. So we would recommend silicon-based so that removal is not traumatic, and we want to try and optimize healing. If the injury occurs on the lower limb, follow your normal procedures within your organization for assessment of the lower limb as edema management and compression is likely to be required. So management strategies to be avoided that are discussed within the document include skin closure strips. And if like me, how many of you have taken a long time to soak and gently remove these paper sutures, which are often applied way too tightly and in a very random application? So I think the least time it's taken me to remove was about 20 minutes and the time was two and a half hours following surgery from a, a total knee replacement. 
They do say, or they, they again, they talk about staples and sutures only being used for full thickness lacerations only. However, even you know within the last week, we've seen that used in our organization, unfortunately, still being used for skin tears. They also say that glue can be used for type one only. However, that's expensive and it does generate hospital activity. We're thinking of the elderly and the frail, we're trying to keep them in their own care setting. They also suggest that iodine-based dressings probably aren't the best to use as they may cause the wound to dry out and therefore, again, we're not optimizing healing with our wound management. So the image you can see on the left clearly shows my mum, June. So this is a fairly recent skin tear that unfortunately she experienced, despite the fact that she had two layers on her arm and it was some books that fell off a shelf and caused the injury to occur. She managed to align her skin to herself using wet kitchen towel and applied a silicone adhesive dressing. So in this instance, you can see it's a leave in life. However, she calls this her pink plaster, despite me telling her differently. So she's even told me, um, actually when I spoke to her yesterday, that she even offered a neighbor advice who had been trying to, who'd suffered a skin tear. Um, apparently she'd been trying to roll the, the skin back because she thought it was a bad thing to have it on top of the wound. So she was trying to roll it back and she was gonna cut it off. Um, but actually mum, she then suggested that perhaps she should roll it back down once she'd got the advice from my mum. She asked her how long she did it. She said it was three days ago. Mum told her it was far too long and to just cover it. So clearly all the education that I keep giving is, is going in somewhere. So, but it's just to be aware that even with appropriate sort of preventative measures, they will still occur. Now, the image on the right is taken from our recent skin tear pathway. Um, and actually, what I wanted to talk about is that this demonstrates how once you've realigned the skin tear, they do recommend that any dressings that you use, that you find a way of ensuring that the next clinician that's going to remove that, if it's not yourself, knows how to remove it in the appropriate way so that you're not um, pulling off that, that realigned um, skin that you've just aligned in the, in the correct direction. So we've demonstrated this with an arrow across um, the silicone adhesive dressing. So in this instance, it's a leave gentle border. So you can mark it with an arrow and that's to indicate the direction of dressing removal. However, what we found at our recent skin tear launch was 50% of the clinicians were unsure whether to remove it in the direction of the arrow or start from the tip of the arrow. We also discussed the, you know, adding a date and would that be helpful? But again, it was about a 50, 50 um, percent were confused in terms of whether they thought that that was a date that it had been applied or the date to be removed. So I think when you're considering putting an arrow or putting information on, just think that you do need to be really clear and you may need to create additional markings to demonstrate at what point that dressing needs to be removed, as I said, in order to ensure that the skin tear and that any flap that you've realigned remains in place. So risk assessment is an important element of prevention and your holistic assessment of the patient may uncover multifactorial elements that lead not only to an increase of risk of skin tests but other situations such as an increased risk of falls. When we're thinking about prevention we need to consider that education to both patients carers and family members is a really vital element so that they understand the risks and are able to implement prevention strategies. As we've mentioned already, that, that some of the strategies will help to reduce other risks, for example, improved lighting, good footwear and medication optimization may also reduce your falls risk. It's really important that skin assessment becomes part of a daily personal care with emollients and clothing key elements and the reduction of skin tears to try and avoid um, further skin tears from occurring. And it's really important to know what to do and how to refer on if that wound is not progressing or infection occurs. So really in summary, I think it's really important to, to consider as Jackie mentioned in her presentation, all of the clinical signs and symptoms around the signs of old age of some of the clinical presentations that we've discussed and, but there, and also to be aware that some of these symptoms may not just be old age but may indicate underlying pathologies. So it's really important that you treat your findings as the standard practice, that you monitor them, that you will re-evaluate an appropriate time scale and escalate if there is no improvement so that appropriate interventions can take place. 
and I'd like to hand back to Ed now just to continue the presentation tonight. Jackie, thank you. Um, Jackie Fletcher, thank you. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm not alone in thinking that some of the comments coming through have been very kind, so thank you for um, all the lovely words out there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to crack on with the questions, if that's okay. We've had loads come through. Um, so um, if that's okay with you both, I'm going to move on to question one. Um, so the first one, um, Jackie Dark, is for you. Okay. Why does having previous episodes of cellulitis put a patient at risk of having one again in the future? Yes, it does. There's been lots of evidence looking at um, the impact of recurrent cellulitis in patients both with lymphedema and chronic edema and patients without. Certainly having lymphedema increases your risk. And so you end up with this sort of vicious cycle because it, it impacts quite significantly on the lymphatic system. So that's one of the reasons for wanting to manage the patient sort of in terms of prophylaxis. Unfortunately, prophylaxis in terms of antibiotics is not always the best thing. So microbiologists are not always keen on that. But in terms of patients with, with lymphedema, it is something that at the moment, most of the pathways and lymphology pathways are recommending because their risks are increased. Brilliant, thank you. Jackie Fletcher, anything to add or um, are you happy with that concise answer? Uh, just to support what Jackie said, I think it's such a complex situation with the patients with cellulitis, keeping on top of them is really hard. And even if the nurse doesn't always believe they're going to get it again, I think lots of times the patients know that it's going to come back and listening to them is really important because they often know before we see the acute cellulitis, they will tell you about that changing pain, that itch, their awareness that something is changing. And that's when we should be starting to, to get straight back to them. Brilliant, thank you. I'm being directed to ask questions of one or either of you specifically or both of you, but please feel free to chip in with any other information if you want. So the next question is for both. Um, it can sometimes be tricky to identify small areas of tendon in a wound with lots of slough. Do you have any clinical guidance that will help with easier identification? Jackie Fletcher, you want to start with that? Yeah, I think exactly what I said previously and um, see if you can see it moving. So if it's on the lower limb, get the patient to dorsiflex the foot, move it up and down. Uh -huh. If the lighting's not very good, if you're wearing gloves, wet your gloves so you've got wet fingers, put your hand on it. You may not see it, but you will certainly feel it move. Um, so even if you put your hand on the surrounding skin, sometimes you can feel that moving if you're a bit squeamish about putting your hand directly on the wound. Would you say that's about right, Jackie? Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right about lighting. Lighting is so important. And we've talked about lighting in terms of risk for patients with skin tears and falls, etc. But even just assessing the skin. And so many patients in their own home have the lighting's quite dark, the curtains are drawn. So I think it's really important that you have additional lighting to be able to assess the skin and wounds well, yeah. Yeah, and if in, in any doubt, keep it hydrated. Don't put the scalpel anywhere near it. You know, if you think it's if you think it's tendon, keep it viable. Keep it nice and moist. Don't let anybody try and debride it until you get it into good light and you've got somebody who knows a bit more about what they're doing looking at it. Fantastic, thank you. So question three is for Jackie Fletcher. Um, you presented on a skincare pathway using a step up and step down approach. Do you think pathways such as these can be used where we want to promote self shared care. Yeah, I really do. I think one of the reasons that these things need to be simple, they need to be pictorial and they need to have those simple things like um, what you use, how often you use it, how much of it you use and when to move up and down is so we can get patients engaged because you could make an that a clinician knows how to do something but if you are giving information to patients putting the care in their own hands we need to be really clear that they know when they need to ask for help or when they can step back down you know so if they if they're using some of the more expensive products and things are healing or improving that they can move to something simpler because what we don't want them is over hydrating the skin or causing further problems with the skin but i think the important thing is about when to ask for help and who to ask for help and how to do it. So making sure you've got the community nurse number on there, you've got ways to contact people, you know, what their opening times are, they're all really important in giving the patient confidence that they can use it. And I would always say that with any of these things, one of the most important things you can leave them is the kind of diary thing with a space for notes. 
because if you are going back once a week to check how they've got on, you say, are there any problems? And they go, no. And then as you're leaving, they go, oh, there was a thing, but I can't remember what it was. But if you encourage them to write them down as they happen, then actually you're far more likely to get a good reflection of what they've struggled with or what they didn't struggle with. And I think I was using a product the other day and giving it to an elderly family member in their 80s. Um, and it was the cleaning solution. And one of the things that I showed them several times was you have to take the cap off. There's a ring around it. You take the ring off and you have to put the cap back on because if you don't take that off, it won't open. And I could just imagine them if I hadn't shown them that repeatedly, they would spend ages trying to get the thing off. Then they, they you know, uh, Peter would attack it with a pair of scissors because he knew he needed to get in it. It's making sure the simple things are there to support self-care. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so question four for both of you. In darker skin tones, do we see changes in venous symptoms on the leg? So with red leg syndrome, how would this present? You definitely see symptoms of uh, uh, venous disease in the lower limb. If you look in the document, there's some really nice pictures provided by Leon Aitken from mid Yorks of uh, hemosiderin staining, uh, of discoloration to the lower leg. They just don't appear as redness. What you see is a change in colour. What's really important when we're talking about different skin tones, don't assume it will be darker. Sometimes it's lighter, sometimes it's grey, um, and sometimes we see completely different skin colours. So there are some really good examples in there of where a patient's had a wound and they've now got scars, so they had quite black skin, but the scar is very pink. Fantastic, thank you. Jackie, do you want to add to that? I was just, no, I, I knew that was perfect explanation. I was just going to say the same. You know, it's important to, to look at, at their normal skin and, and actually assess it against that. So you're comparing like the light like region for region. Um, I think that's really important. But again, you know, it's really hard for some of these patients. It, you know, they are at greater risk, particularly if they haven't got full capacity, that, you know, they're nonverbal, all of those things. And it's really important that we, um, that we share that with our colleagues, that they know how to look and how to assess it. You do have to have additional skills so that you're looking for that and you're assessing and determining whether that change in the skin is associated with heat because that's going to determine whether there's acute inflammation or not so it is about us getting you know upskilling ourselves i think and, and ensuring our colleagues are skilled as well in that in in terms of assessment Fantastic. The other thing that came through i'm sorry to jump but the other thing that came through in preparing that document um <clears throat> was people's reluctance to talk about this or yeah. not knowing the right words being afraid to say the wrong thing to offend somebody to 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 not know how to ask a question and hopefully what we're trying to get people to do is to, to recognize that you're not going to offend somebody by saying do you describe your skin as black or brown because the, it, the skin is the color that it is but also that even people with dark skin don't always know the difference because if they've been taught as a clinician they tend to have been taught with white skin and one of the questions I asked of a colleague was um, given that you have black skin I know that the soles of your feet are lighter so, but what I don't know is that if you've got a heel pressure ulcer kind of on the bit that covers the dark bit and the white bit, does the white bit blanch? Because I know the black bit probably won't. And she actually said to me, I have no idea. And she took her shoes and socks off and had to look herself because she didn't know. And I think we have to accept there's that lack of level of knowledge everywhere. So never be scared to ask the question. As long as you're polite and professional, people are not going to mind. Brilliant, thank you. I better pile on, so I've got a load of questions in front of me here. Um, so for Jackie Fletcher, COVID toes have been reported as pressure ulcers from friction and shearing. How can we distinguish between them? Um, I think a lot of it is about history. So if you feel there is friction and shearing, where's that come from? The COVID toes tend to be chillblain-like, so they tend to be blisters and associated with dark discoloration underneath them. Um, and the patient will often tell you there's been no history of pressure damage. So a lot of it is about asking questions. And sometimes it's a disease of, of exclusion. You know, uh, I've got no history of pressure. My toes haven't been trapped. I've got this it's often acutely painful, like um, chillblains can be very painful um, and no other things there. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to keep going through these now because I want to make sure as many people get the answers that they've been craving. So question six again for you, Jackie Fletcher. Can the COVID virus increase leg ulcers or other wound manifestations? The COVID virus um, 
works by two main pathways. So we know it has an inflammatory response. We know that it has a vascular response. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you think about what we think about with lots of our chronic wounds, most of them relate to inflammation or vascular disease. So we have no clear evidence that relates the two, but that inflammatory cascade and um, that cytokine storm that's talked about both in chronic wounds and in COVID, if you look at them logically, we feel there should be some link between them, but the research isn't there to say that that's the case. And if we look at the, um, the data on the increase in pressure ulcers during COVID or the increase in leg ulcers or leg ulcer complications, we can't pin any of that down to inflammatory processes or vascular processes. Most of it is about um, reducing footfall, reluctance of patients to seek help. So although we believe, in answer to the question, yes, there is probably some link, some inflammation, some vascular, some cytokine links, we have no evidence that that is the case. Brilliant, thank you. And following on from that, should we add the COVID skin changes to the Datex options, or how would you document this? Um, I wouldn't say you could add COVID skin changes to a Datex option because it's not a harm. It's not something that happened because of a lack or failure in care. It is a symptom of a disease. So in the same way um, that you wouldn't add hemosiderin staining, in a venous leg ulcer to Datex, you can't say a COVID screen would be added to Datex. Brilliant, thank you. Jackie Dark, question for you, number eight. How can you best challenge an individual with non-healing wounds with regards to compliance? Wow, good grief. Oh, I mean, that's mammoth in itself, isn't it, as a question? Um, and I think it really is about that partnership working, isn't it? it and I think sometimes we, you know you hear I hear clinicians all the time get really frustrated that they've told that patient once before but I you know so obviously with my mum she's 91 and I know that the conversations that we have are the same when I see her regularly and I think it you know we do have to accept that from a, a cognitive perspective that we do have to keep having the same conversations and repeat those conversations and and find out and try to meet that patient part way and find out what they're um, I suppose their beliefs are, what they know, what they understand about the condition, that we kind of re instigate that whole conversation again every time we see them so that you know we're not just accepting that you know they're non-concordant or compliant at one point and then um, and assume that's the same when we see them again. Unfortunately you know those those words and those terms are often banded about by clinicians and then patients get that label and we've heard I've heard patients you know they won't put their feet up etc and then you go and have a long conversation you find out that patient's got arterial symptoms so yes of course they're not going to put their foot up because actually it's uncomfortable for them so I think sometimes you know we are it, it, you know at the moment we know that the care is relentless we know that there's not enough nurses to deliver the care and it's very easy to to go in and and be very task focused but actually it is really important to have those conversations and those explanations um, and try to uncover what that what the patient wants I think we're very good at wanting to deliver what we feel is the right thing without actually finding out what the patient's needs are and delivering our care to meet their needs yeah agreed um Jackie you're, you're up next um it's another big one um, when you have a wound under control in the healing trajectory, what is then needed for onward healing? Um, keep doing whatever you were doing that's got it on that trajectory in the first place, I would say. So uh, keep re-evaluating, reassessing, making sure that that progress continues, that it's progress in line with what you would expect for that type of the wound and the patient's comorbidities uh, and what the patient wants, just keeping the patient safe and the wound moving forward. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Jackie Dart, how do we manage hyperkaryotic skin in the type two diabetic patient? Well, I mean, certainly we know that emollients are really important for skin health for all patients, regardless of diabetes or not. I think we need to think about trying to reduce, obviously, the dryness, that fissuring that we see, particularly in patients with diabetes, 
particularly if they've got autonomic, autonomic neuropathy. Um, one of the ways of doing that is to use emollients that have high urea content. But if you've got open areas, just be aware that, that um, high urea content emollients can actually cause a bit of stinging. And then once we've got that um, condition under control, one of the things you can do then is use a slightly lower level um, urea. But again, it's really, as Jackie was talking earlier, it's about that step up and that step down, knowing when, when to step up. And it might be for some patients that you'd never have that step down, that once you've reached that, that, um, that good skin health, that actually the only thing that maintains it is that emollient with a high urea content. Um, so some of it is, is actually really an evaluation with the patient themselves. Um, and then it may change. It may change depending upon footwear, clothing, seasons, whether they've got heating, whether they've got gas fires on, what happens in the summer. So it is about them learning and clinicians learning to adjust depending upon clinical symptoms, but also the environment that, that you're managing the patient in as well. Brilliant. Thank you. And based on the time, this is now the last question. Um, and you, Jackie Dark. Does having bullous pemphigoid BP increase the likelihood of cellulitis? If so, are there any recommendations to aid its identification in patients already suffering from BP? So I'm, I'm going to ask Jackie as well in a minute. I'm not aware of any research that would suggest that. However, logically, if you've got blisters, particularly around the foot, and we see that a lot as localised around the foot and the toes, then just by the very nature of the fact that you've got a blister and if the that blister breaks that you've actually then got an open area but they don't they're not down to the dermis so it is the epidermis that's impacted or that the layer between the two and they do heal quite quickly and they crust over but the more open areas you've got the greater the increased risk of any infection regardless and if they're occurring on the lower limb then logically it would suggest to me that that would increase that risk but I'm not aware of any papers that, that would say that. I don't know if you are, Jackie. No, I mean, I'm following the same thought process as you, Jackie, that lower limb, uh, they're often quite itchy. If they're scratching yeah. around their feet, then the risk of contamination and fungal infection um, yeah. is quite high. Guys, thank you both so much. Um, it's been an awesome event. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all your questions. Um, before I move on to some thank yous and our close, if you want any more information, any more awesome education around products, um, symptoms, wound care in general, please subscribe to the Wound Club online. There should be information now. Um, it's a fantastic platform that Smith and Nephew has spent a lot of time and effort putting together. So please go and get involved. And if you've enjoyed this, our last event of 2021 is tomorrow night on our Journal of Community Nursing platform. So please, please, please join us if you have the time. Um, guys, thank you so much. Um, the, the link for the certificate attendance is available now. Um, the, the slides will be available for download on the Wound Care Today website within the next 24 hours. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping I need to get through. So um, a big thank you to both our speakers um, for all the efforts, not just over the last hour, but in the preparation for tonight's event. A uh, big thank you to Smith & Nephew, our partners. Um, to the team at Mole Digital and Wound Care Today. I'm well aware how much effort goes on uh, behind the scenes, so thank you to you all. And last but not least, to our audience tonight. Um, you guys are incredible. You continue to inspire me and my team. Stay safe, stay strong, have a lovely evening, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>